Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with the Amiga we looked at in the first video. So, uh, the way we left this, it was actually working, but if you switched it off and on sort of super quick, you would get an exception to Guru. When I tested with the Diagnostics BIOS, it was coming up with an address error, um, randomly, hardly ever, hardly ever at all. Um, I think initially, I would put that down to the bad contacts in one or two of the sockets. In the first part, I fixed a few connections here that were bad. Uh, I think there was one somewhere else on the board, I can't remember. Um, and we cleaned up the expansion slot down there, as well as reintroducing all the chips because it was a completely bare bones board. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to upgrade the RAM. So, yeah, I'll show you that first. I'm going to swap that resistor out for a small resistor. Cosmetically, it looks a bit big. Uh, the ones I've got, the blue, you know, they're not the same colour body as that, but it should be about the same size physically. I think it's like half a watt. Um, I had one of those crazy moments where I looked at the service manual and I could have sworn it said 2 watts, so I ordered 2 watts, I think this is what we ended up with. And then I thought, well, it must be 1 watt, so I ordered 1 watt, but it was still larger than this. And then I ordered some uh, quarter watts and then I realised this is not quarter of a watt, these are quarter of a watts. <laughs> so I've ended up with tons of 47 ohm resistors and then I finally got some half watts ones, but the blue instead of having the cream uh, package there. So I think the other thing that we will do while we're here is install four sockets here. Um, put four of these uh, 0.33 um, microfarad, you know, the 330 nanofarad caps in the position to there, you know, bypass cap for each. But it will be useful to have the uh, sockets on here. I'm not even sure whether I'll sell it, I might even keep it as a spare. Yeah, so it looks like the sockets are 20 pin. There's something very therapeutic about sticking sockets onto boards like this. Nearly out of solder. Yeah, so four nice new sockets. Uh, I'm not sure that chip's slightly slanted one way. You know, it's, the sockets sometimes can move around a bit. I did try and get them straight, but perhaps not as straight as it could be. Still, they're on there nice and cleanly. I will clean off the flux on the underside in a minute. So I just need to fit four of these now, uh, and you'll see the legs are not really ideally suited to this. These ones are like, I think they're axial. So yeah, what I've been doing with these, um, on the other boards, is very carefully just grab it near the bottom there. You've got to be careful, you don't want to break the uh, plastic or ceramic uh, cover in there, whatever around it. Um, just near to the end, bend it outwards. Yeah, like that, kind of a crazy angle. Um, and then bend them downwards. About there. And that should be about right if we just straighten them out a little bit. Uh, I'll try and get them all with the uh, number facing forward. I'm going to be marked 334, uh, which means 330 nanofarads. Is that a hole? Yeah, it is. Like that. There we go, four sockets and four caps. So I'll just clean off the solder points underneath. So I'll go with the cotton bud first and then I'll just brush it down with some IPA. It's going to take a while to get some of the flux off here, whatever you to use extra heat. The caps are the hardest bit to solder here, especially the, uh, is it the ground? Yeah, I think the ground side, because all this here is all ground. So yeah, I had to crank the solder station up to 480 to be able to get a nice uh, flow on those uh, cap points there. Just get a little bit of IPA around there and just have a bit of bush around. We'll have some cotton strands there from when I was using the cotton buds, but obviously you know the flux as well, so let's try and clean that up. Now if memory serves, we'll probably need to uh, update a jumper. Um, let's see if we get these in carefully here. Is that a pin pen? No it's not. Yeah, carefully get them in one side and then just push them into position. Um, yeah, I've got only I've only got eight of these. Uh, these are the chips that I don't have many of uh, as a spare. Um, many of the other types of uh, DRAM you get on other systems, I've got lots of, um, which is the good news. These were bought brand new from a guy in Australia, actually. Um, I forget his name now. It's a guy that frequented the Amiga forum there, and he was good enough to ship me out 
two sets of these uh, a number of years back, probably about seven or eight years ago now. So, yeah, let's just inspect that. Is that okay, yeah. Um, so, as I say, memory serves. I think we'll probably need to change a jumper. So, with regards to the jumper positions, JP2 needs to be in the top position there. I found the way this is working for me. This one's JP3. You leave this exactly as it is. And JP7A here next to the uh, memory expansion slot, you make sure you cut the uh, join because I think two of these were joined together. I forget which ones it was now. It might be in the bottom two here. There might be a little uh, trace. I think I can just about see the end of it there. Um, so that basically all three of those pads are isolated from each other. Uh, now the net result is from what I remember, because I'm filming this bit at the end of the video here, uh, when you add an expansion RAM module in here, it's not detected, I don't think. I could not get more than one meg on this board and from what I understand it's due to fitting the RAM down here so if you don't fit the RAM down here and change the jumpers and things as I've done and just plug a memory expansion in there you will get half a meg of uh, you know uh, slow turning up and you could probably do the change to JP2 here at that point and end up with one meg of chip that way so it would seem that without modification these Rev 6A boards can only support one meg of RAM you know you can either have one meg of chip or one meg, uh, half a meg of chip and half a meg of slow Please post in the comments down below if you know otherwise, but I, I think I did see a circuit involving a couple of, uh, you know, uh, 7 4 series ICs that you could uh, put on a piece of breadboard or something and modify this board a little bit in order to support an extra, you know, half meg of slow and still have your one meg of chip. This is one of the games that just kept coming up saying insufficient store, which was a clue to me that it didn't have enough memory, actually. Sweet. So something else I wanted to just quickly touch on here. Uh, you can see this is an 8372A um, that's marked faulty. This is one I kept from back in the day. I had vague recollections of this having a clock fault. Uh, and I'll just show you, the, if I switch the Amiga on, you can hear the floppy drive make a noise there. I'll do that again. Do you hear that? that so I'll switch it on again. Nothing, no video. Now bear in mind, if I connected this to uh, an old analog video source, you know, not a source, a destination, something like a CRT, you might see a black screen of some sort, but yeah, it's not booting. And I guess this evidence is what I was talking about in the previous video about the clocks coming from Agnes. If we check the CPU clock, this is a good thing to do. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Pin 15 is a clock pin, can you see? It's just stuck green, stuck low. Switch it on. It's just low, there's no clock. That's why we're getting no video. So that went high then low. Yeah, so that is the fault with this Agnes. Uh, but the reason why I kept it back in the day, it's a bit like the Neo Geo, you know, in theory, I might be able to fix this if I worked out where that clock comes from on here and isolate it. Create my own little clock circuit there that maybe synchronizes to one of the other clocks, you know, so that the, the synchronization's correct there. Uh, I mean, I might have to take it from the straight from the crystal and produce the, the signal that comes here, you know, divide it down. It's like that's 28.3 something uh, megahertz there. This is going to be 7, 7 point something megahertz. I think it's a bit faster on the ST. The ST's like 8 or something around that. But nevertheless, if I divided that clock down myself and fed a clock signal to here, um, I'm guessing in theory it might work if that was the only issue here it might be a case that it's failed further internally inside the logic there that means it's not outputting uh, multiple clocks or the clock that's not coming out to here might get used for other things within here and you know it's it, the, the functionality that's failed is further inside if you see what I mean it's not just the output of the clock to here it's actually where that clock is divided down and then output to here so it could you know it might not work at all but I might revisit this I don't know um, I could scope you know the other thing you want to do is get the scope on there and check the clock pin but also check the other clocks because there's a number of clocks come out of uh, for Agnes here but I thought you might just find that interesting just something to share with you and again just to show you and to test my chips as well because I've got a couple of these spare you can see you've got an 8371 in there so that's the half meg one uh, and I've got a kickstart 1.2 ROM there uh, but you can see it's working. And it's the same with my other spare 8371. So I just want to show you with no CIA there, you can actually boot these up. But you will be lacking the floppy drive 
and it doesn't do the clicking. Just listen. No drive seek at all. So yeah, just bear that in mind. So apologies if the camera wobbles about a bit. All the pins on the bottom are okay, but as you can see here, well hopefully, we've got you know a, a, some darkness here, some oxidization, same here, same here. A few pins there are right, maybe that one, uh, these, some of these round here, um, and then obviously the odd one around here I think. Yeah, I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see that at all. Uh, certainly those first two or three there, well the second one's alright, but the f first and the third, definitely the third, they just look oxidised. It's not really corrosion as such, but there is some oxidisation gone on. Um, I think the first thing I might just try here is get a bit of a deoxid um, and uh, put it on the into the hole there and uh, stick the chip in and out a few times. I might find something similar, a similar sort of thickness of the leg that I could maybe push in and out there. Um, and just see if that makes any difference. I'd like to try a few different techniques and then as I said we'll perhaps desolder, might try and desolder that third pin if it doesn't clean up and uh, swap it out without removing the socket. Um, the best way to do it perhaps is to remove the socket because then you can deal with any of the pins all at the same time. But uh, yeah we might resort to that. We'll just see, see how I get on. Yeah so I've got a little bit of deoxid into that first pin there. Uh, and there's only so much cleaning up you can do because what you don't want to do is widen the thing but you know I got my little flat tool here on the back um, you know the, the metal part on the back side there I just slid up and down it try and clean the surface a little bit um, but what you don't want to do is shove something like this in there because you'll obviously widen it um, and it's the same thing up here I've just lightly scratched the surface just see if I can get any of the oxidization off there but you can see it just look dark you know it's still not any different I think the next thing I'm going to try is a bit of vinegar. Um, so I'll get some white vinegar and we'll just get the two to push into there and give it a clean up and just see if that makes any difference to these. So we'll just uh, get a little bit of white vinegar in there. I've uh, got some on the board there, it's not a problem. I can clean, obviously I'll clean this up afterwards with IPA because this is an acid. But uh, yeah, we might just find if we just get a little bit of acid in there, it could well help clean up these pins somewhat. The very worst case is we just take the socket off and replace it or fix the pins individually once it's off. What I do know is from the experience I've had using this uh, to clean up uh, traces and tracks and things on the PCB, it does a really, really good job actually. Um, it's never something I would have considered for just general purpose cleaning of oxidised uh, connections and things. but. Yeah, I certainly would moving forward. You just need to make sure you remove it afterwards, you know, clean up with IPA, you know, give this whole area a really good scrub and then swab and uh, wipe down with IPA afterwards. Yeah, as I say, the bottom row here doesn't really need doing, but you know what, we'll just do it for comparison anyway. It'd be interesting to see if they look worse after they've been done with vinegar. So that did bring them up a bit better actually. What I've just done though, it might look a mess now, is I've just put some uh, deoxid. Because the one I did here uh, looks a lot cleaner actually. If anything it's kind of gone a little bit copperish actually. The others uh, were just the same, they didn't really improve much with the vinegar, just a little bit. So I've put some deoxid in a number of these here. And I'm just going to leave that for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. And then I'll uh, use the, a bit of vinegar again and then clean off with IPA. And we'll just see if it's any better at the end of that process. So did that work? I think yes it did. If you look at the back sides of those pins there, they're looking a bit cleaner. The one down here that had uh, some more deoxid than any of this and vinegar as well, it's a little bit copperish, you know, it's almost like it's uh, took too much off the surface there. But actually those are a lot better. Yeah, they're definitely a lot better. I wouldn't actually go as far as needing to swap that socket out, I don't think. Um, because the other thing here, this isn't the sort of corrosion that you would uh, normally see on these, you know, where the battery's leaked on a 500 plus, for example. It's just a bit of oxidisation. Yes, yeah, so the two different things they're using deoxid uh, or vinegar, and the vinegar seems to have made most of the difference actually. Um, that's done the job. So I cleaned up with IPA afterwards, used the toothbrush again, and then I used the hot air station, set to 100 degrees just to dry it off. So just testing after doing that work to the garage socket. That has made a massive, massive, massive difference. It seems to have just solved it, actually. 
I think, I mean, the Gary, you know, um, I don't know if I mentioned, but Gary, I kind of was like a, a shortened down, you know, use of the letters that spell Gatorade. That's how they came with Gary, apparently, if you believe that. Um, so, yeah, it's a Gatorade. Lots of address decoding and stuff going on there. Well, pretty much all of the backbone of the system address decoding goes through Gary. Um, so if you've got a problem there, you're going to get gurus and things, but I haven't had one since I just did that work here. Normally, switching it off and on like this, if I did it, you know, switch it off and on quickly like that, I would get a guru. It's not guru at all. It's perfect now. So yeah, I mean, there were several pins at least on there that were, you know, pretty oxidized. So I think that was the case, you know, that, that was all it was. But I'll go through and do the same on the other sockets now. Um, I think there was like one pin on the 68,000 socket and one or two pins in some of the other sockets there, but I think uh, that's all that's wrong with it. Uh, I'll swap out the caps and things while I'm here as well. I might not do all of them, I'll certainly test them. Um, but like, I'd be stupid to not swap out the two main 3300 microfarad caps and the 470. So whilst it's rock solid as is, I'm going round and doing the other socket, so there's like two pins here that were questionable. Um, one over here, one over there, I think. Uh, none in the Denise. Uh, and you can just see here several here actually but they're just like again superficial really light oxidization one or two of these here just looked a tiny bit there's like a little bit of green on the surface hardly anything but uh, yeah I think that's all it needs I wouldn't go as far as always having to replace all the sockets it depends on what the issue is you know if this was a 500 plus and it was definitely battery leakage that caused it yeah I would definitely do it but I think not I think what's happened with this one someone's removed the chips and it's just been stored somewhere in a barn or a loft or something you know somewhere damp uh, and I think that's perhaps what's happened to this one yeah so one or two of these are a bit dark but yeah they're a lot better they don't need replacing um, but you could do what I did in the previous video which is you know take the socket off and uh, swap a, a pin around they just push out I'll show you that on a new socket I'm sure I've shown you this before but if you just grab a pin on the socket and uh, push it upwards can you see that it starts to come out push it a bit further uh, and you can literally just you very carefully pull the pin out like this so you could you know take a, a socket like that that's got a missing pin and use the remaining pins to fix uh, some of these sockets they vary a little bit depending on manufacturer so you might need to look through all your sockets till you find one that's got exactly the right profile of pin but in general uh, you can swap the pin out uh, pretty easily and then put it back in you know just grab it uh, and shove it back in the right way it can only go one way around and if we just uh, push that down on that side and then you can just pull it a little bit from this side there we go that's back in so you can see that you can pretty easily swap pins and sockets like that um, it can just save you a bit of expense but you know what sockets are generally pennies anyway something like this is probably only cost about seven or eight pence or maybe ten pence even at ebay prices got an interesting story uh, about 68,000 uh, cpu actually the first time i saw one of these and the amiga um when i was studying at the college i was at um one of the guys one of the lads there brought in his 68,000 and he got it out of his pocket <laughs> He just pulled it out of his pocket, he was like, look at this, look at the size of this CPU, isn't it wonderful, what a beauty, you know. Um, and he bent one of the two of the pins and he was straightening them out with uh, some pliers and stuff. And then he proceeded to stick it back in his pocket and I was like, oh my god, you know, I can't believe this guy's walking around with his CPU out of his system from home in his pocket. Just to show us, you know, with no, uh, you know, ESD protection or anything. You know, you think he could have at least stuck it in a piece of uh, ESD foam and a plastic bag of some sort. But... Um, so he then said, uh, do you guys want to come and see this Amiga at lunch and you know, I'll take you home. So he lived nearby and it took about 20 minutes to walk there. We only had an hour lunch, so we only had 20 minutes looking at his machine. But anyway, he took us uh, to his flat where he was living at the time and uh, he took his CPU out of his pocket, strained out some of the legs on it, plugged it into his Amiga. You know, he had the lid off his Amiga. And I was amazed at, uh, you know, the chipset and stuff and the fact everything was socketed. It looked an amazing machine. And he booted up a couple of games. He booted up the first two Amiga games I ever saw. One was Dragon Ninja and the other one was uh, New Zealand Story 
uh, both uh, at the time blew me away. You know, they looked absolutely amazing, especially New Zealand Story. I was like, wow, this is arcade perfect. I have to get an Amiga. And it's around that time I got my placement on so my first, uh, uh, you know, work experience while I was studying at the same time, and that was. Ultimately, the place I ended up working at full time after my training finished. So, gradually working my way around refitting these, I'll just show you something. I need to do the clean the back two sockets up first. But you push Polar in, just watch, and she pushes in like that, and you think, how oh, that's in. But actually, it isn't, even though it feels like she's in there. Just watch. Did you hear that little click? Yeah, there's like a further step where it pushes in and snaps in between the pins. So yeah, you need to be mindful of that. I just had that issue with uh, Denise over here. I thought Denise was a bit loose. I was like, wow, that's not very well fit. And then I pushed it and it went snap and it fit right in there. And if you try and lever it out again, it's uh, a lot harder to get out. So yeah, there's kind of some of these, you don't always get that. Sometimes they slide in fairly stiffly on all the way in, you know, and you can't push them any further. And then other times, like the ones that are on this, they push in and you think it's fairly firm, but you can snap it, you know, further in by pushing it harder down. These have had a bit of deoxit on any of the dirty pins. I think this one had one. Um, and then, after about 10 minutes, I then put vinegar into all the pins there, left it soaking for another 10 minutes, and then uh, dried it all off because the vinegar doesn't disappear, it doesn't evaporate after 10 minutes like IPA does. Um, so I mopped that up with the uh, cotton buds and the paper towel, and then went over it with IPA as you can see here. Uh, now, the IPA will evaporate, but you can collect the majority of it up with paper towel like this from around the edges um, you can get it into the middle of the things there I will typically then use uh, cotton buds just to try and mop up any more from around there and it does go kind of further with fields you know as you use the brush it gets everywhere I mean it's a good opportunity to try and clean the board up at the same time you know we're getting lots of dirt from around the uh, area here at the same time so nothing lost by doing this if your sockets need a clean. In the first video all I did was use the uh, IPA and a toothbrush there you know and that just wasn't enough. The deoxin and the vinegar was needed. And as you'll see in a minute I'll give you a close-up of this socket it should look almost good as new. We get the hot air and you can sometimes see it. You can see it here leaking out from underneath so this is why I use the hot air. It's just going to make sure that everything dries up totally well here. I've only got it set to 100 degrees so I don't melt the socket. But you can go, uh, you know, sort of under the edge of the socket here just to make sure you've got, you, you know, you flush out any contaminant from underneath it. The airflow's set pretty high for that reason. You can see some there moving around in the middle. But after a second or two, it evaporates. Uh, you can do the same thing over the tops of the pins as well just for several seconds at 100 degrees you'll be all right it's just boiling point it's not going to melt so again on macro you can see the pins are looking great on that i think no worries at all so i'll get the cia back in so do inspect your pins can you see up here one or two of these are just slightly bent out here um And make sure obviously they're all in uh, profile here. Do wear an ESD wrist strap when you're handling the chips here. Um, I often don't show it. Sometimes you might find that I'm not wearing one. Um, and there's a reason for that. Often I'll, uh, you know, I've got a light switch just nearby and a radiator. And I know because I've wired the sockets in myself, I've changed the sockets in the past, and know that the screws on them are earthed. So I'll often touch those screws and then I'm handling the board, you know, like a second later. Strictly speaking, any movement, especially when you're on carpet, any movement at all, depending on the type of uh, clothing you're wearing, the footwear you're wearing, etc., you can generate ESD. You can get an ESD charge really super easily. And then, uh, you know, you touch the pins on here and you introduce, you know, a few thousand volts or more. Um, so you can damage ICs, you know, from mishandling, from not wearing an ESD wrist strap. You just have to look at a CIA the wrong way and uh, it will fail. And don't forget, your ESD wrist strap should be joined to your nearest uh, source of uh, ESD. Uh, sorry, uh, ground. I still need to clean the sockets up for this one. This is one of my spare chips. It's not going to stay on this board, I don't think, unless I just leave the chips on it and keep this as a spare. Um, which I might do. I'm not sure I'm going to sell all these boards. Uh, some stuff I'll keep as spares. I had just enough uh, chips in my collection for two whole boards, which is what I've used to, in these videos here to fix uh, these Amigas. So, you know, if I get rid of these, I haven't got any spares left. 
and I do always like to have at least a full set of spares per system um, or a spare system and I've got a 500 and a 500 plus which we'll show you in a future video I couldn't have done that actually without the help of Patreon support that's one thing I'm very grateful for uh, the people that do support me on Patreon means that I can buy consumables for these things you know it's like flux it costs me like £15 every time I need some more flux and I'm going through an awful lot of flux again bent pin there um, yeah so without Patreon support the channel wouldn't be the same i would be just doing nothing but fixing joysticks and you might see a video a month or something without Patreon yeah so the channel continues to go on because of Patreon support without Patreon support I've already decided there's no point there's no point the amount of time I spend doing these and it might sound like I'm whinging here but you've got to realize how much time it takes me the last uh, few of these Amigas I've spent my whole weekend uh, like you know from the minute I've got up to you know six seven o'clock at night um, editing it takes three or four hours to edit a one hour video you wouldn't believe it but it does by the time you've you know in terms of rendering and copying it from one machine to another and then uploading it and adding all the um, tags and all that sort of stuff it takes an incredible amount of work so yeah I'm very very grateful for the Patreon support because it's kept the channel going. Anyway, that chip is now ready to go back in. So I'll just finish cleaning up there. I haven't mopped around that with and brushed in it with IPA. Again, it's one of these things, talking about ESD, technically speaking, something like this can generate ESD, nylon, you know. Um, so, you know, there's lots of angles of uh, risks of ways you can damage systems and things like this with ESD. You can get ESD safe brushes, you know, that are designed for uh, proper cleanup work. Uh, at some point I might uh, try and get one but in fact I've probably got one somewhere but I just find that this is far, you know really useful it's easy to use it's got a, re a reasonable sized head on it um, yeah and if you're careful you won't get any damage it's a similar sort of thing actually with uh, vacuums people will tell you that you can generate massive amounts of static with a vacuum yeah you can but you know what, I've used vacuums to clean computer systems for the last 30 years, you know, my own PC as an example, and uh, all these systems you've seen on my channel, and I've never had any kind of secondary fault developed with anything, um, but ESD in general is a problem. And clean up the wider area with cotton buds and IPA later. And there we go, even CIA socket looking good as new. So yeah, the you know dark uh, grey greeny pins and things all cleaned up on all those sockets. No issues at all. Didn't need to swap a pin on any of them. So I'm nearly out of solder actually. Uh, that's worrying me. Gonna have to find some uh, decent leaded flux cord solder. Uh, it's these two caps here. So we'll set a bit of fresh solder and flux and get those off. I can just use the desolder pump for this. I think my desolder pump needs a clean out actually because the suction is not as good as it uh, should be. Yeah, you go, that's most of the solder off there. What I can do is just hold it from the other side and just gently uh, heat and wiggle the pins. You see that one's free. There you go, it's out and the holes are unblocked for us. So if we just carefully flip this over, um, they have got, interestingly enough, a longer leg on one side, despite the fact they're both bipolar. Um, I'll stick them the same way around, so I'll, if I can, I'll have the longer uh, lead towards the inside of the board there. So we'll just carefully slide that into position, there we go, and just solder it from the other side. Yeah, easy to do. I'll just inspect it to make sure it's flat and doesn't need any adjustment. Yeah, it could do with just bending. Uh, yeah, it could just do with bending that way. You know, up towards my thumb here, just a little bit. It's not quite straight there. I like to try and get these things straight if I can. So we'll just reheat that pin there, and I can push it a little bit. There we go. That should do the trick. Yeah, there we go, nice and straight. And cut off the legs. Clean up with flux. Clean up with the solder braid. Uh, clean up with IPA and a cotton bud. Nice and easy that one was. 
So I've removed the cap from there and I've got most of the solder out there. If I put it up to the light I can actually see a hole through that top a hole there uh, and the bottom one. You can push my finger through that bottom one there. Um, but I thought I'd show you one of the techniques here that I've talked about and not really demonstrated. I might have demonstrated it on a Neo Geo video. If I just, uh, hang on, that drill bit is just a bit big. Let's just find another one. What I was going to say is you get a drill bit um, for time for PCBs like this. Test, oh there you go, it's the right one, it's the right size. Test it on uh, an unblocked hole first, you can see that goes through there without issue. It's a bit tight because there's still a bit of sold on the edge. But what you can do is just carefully, um, once you've got a little pilot on the top there, dead in the centre of the hole, just use a drill bit like this to unblock it. What you don't want to do is use a drill bit that's bigger than the hole because these contain through hole plating. You know, it's like a piece of copper. Sometimes you'll pull it out. If you've ever badly removed an IC, you'll find there's like a, a piece of copper around the pin that sometimes comes out with the pin. But yeah, if we do it on both sides, we can unblock that. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. If I just carefully push the drill up and down like that, you know, it's one of these self-drilling ones. You just hold it with your thumb and then slide the thing up and down and it will drill through. Solder is just, uh, it's gone through that, it's lead and uh, tin. And see, so we've not damaged the plate in there, um, it's, it was dead in the sensor and it just means it's super easy to get a replacement cap on. And to be clear, if you've got a decent uh, desoldering station you won't have any problems on blocking holes like that, or a decent desoldering home for that matter. Most of the time when I do these boards I seldom ever need to do that actually. So the positive marking is down here so the negative band, uh, you can see I'm using Panasonic ones are good again here, CE series, uh, 105 degrees I think, yeah they are, uh, th 3300 microfarad, 10 volts, um, yeah the negative's towards the top there, uh, that one's just going the side isn't it, yeah that one's orientated slightly differently but if we get the positive in and the negative you can see, no problems fitting that, just solder that on now. So there we go, that's another two down, I'll do the 470. Uh, I might swap out some of the 100s, um, I'm not sure. They don't all need doing, I've measured these ones and they're okay. There's nothing wrong with them. It's, this is the thing, people uh, panic and think they need to replace all these caps on these boards and uh, yeah, it's pretty rare that actually they do need swapping out. You could argue that it's preventative maintenance. So, you know, if you want to avoid any future problems, yeah, replace them all. But I mean, I think both my original 500 and 500 plus have still got the original caps. My original, my 1200 still got its original caps, and my CD32 does as well, actually. The CD32 has had some of the caps replaced, the ones, the through hole ones that are mounted the wrong way around, which uh, you know were bulging. But all the SMB caps on there are good, actually. Um, but at some point, I'll do recaps on those. Well, you wouldn't believe it, but that one was proven near impossible. That was harder than any of the others uh, I've done here, actually. Um, what I ended up having to do with that is hold the desolder station on the pin, it was this left hand pin here on the other side, and then with the other iron touch the pin and at the same time somehow try and pull the cap and actually it, the solder went molten on both sides so I was able to suck it off with the des uh, desolder station there and the cap just came straight out. But I must have spent 20 minutes trying to remove that cap. My soldering iron really needs replaced with something uh, decent like a Heiko or a Weller or something. I've swapped out all of the 100s uh, with uh, brand new Panasonics. I've um, got 470 Panasonic, two 3300s Panasonics. Got some nice new uh, audio file quality bipolars there. There's only about six or so caps here, smaller ones. I want to get some uh, replacements for those um, that are Panasonics, but yeah, they're not essential. So you saw me work on this board in a previous video. Uh, I wasn't going to bore you with the replacement of the caps here, but it was something I always planned to do. You know, any of these boards that, certainly anything I sell, I will recap it. So you can see I swapped the ones at the back. Those are 3,300 microfarads, same as on the Rev6 board. Um, now the interesting thing is this is where things well this is where things get interesting. On a Rev6 board, this has been uprated to a 470 microfarad cap. These caps here, instead of being 100, are 47. So on this very early board, you could argue it perhaps didn't have enough. Um, you know the capacitors were not large enough, and that kind of compounds the fact if you've got a Rev5 board, it is well worth recapping because the capacitors are much smaller. On here on this board anyway um, but you could in theory upgrade that one to 470 and swap these ones you know these 47s and there's a few of them um, out for 100s um, as they did in the Rev6A um, and the Rev8. 
So I swapped out the caps at the back for some audio file quality uh, bipolar caps there. Swapped those two, swapped that one. I'm just waiting for some 47 and 22 microfarad uh, Panasonics to replace the remaining caps on this board. But yeah, I wouldn't want to sell this on. I mean, it will be sold by the time I've uh, done this video, but I wouldn't want to sell this Amiga on without having replaced all the caps. I think the other thing I will do before I sell this are heatsink, the uh, Agnes chip there. You might think it's a bit crazy, but actually I've been testing these a fair bit over the last uh, month, um, working on the different boards here, and you know what, the thing that gets the hottest on the board is the Agnes chip by twice as much. You know, this gets twice as hot as, say, the ROM or any of these chips here. The CPU gets fairly warm, but again, nowhere near as warm as Agnes. So for the eagle-eyed, I don't know whether you can tell actually from that angle, the pins here on the floppy drive connector are bent. I hate it when people do that, you know, they pull the cable off and they pull it off an angle and bend these end ones over. Yeah, you might be able to tell more from that angle. Can you see? It's like the last three or four pins here on this side are bent towards the left-hand side. So to show you something different, and just to mix things up a little bit, this is a mouse uh, joystick auto switcher. You can see, see there it says Amiga mouse slash pad auto switcher. Uh, copyright Solid Core 2018. Yeah, Solid Core is a really nice active guy in the uh, you know he's active in the Amiga community, producing little mods for the Amiga here. Um, so this is one he did last year. This actually came uh, courtesy of uh, Anthony over at Right Retro Gaming, actually. Uh, Anthony <laughs> gets mentioned so much recently, it's ridiculous. Um, I'm sure he's got shares in my channel. Anyway, yeah, Anthony uh, was giving some of these away as uh, prizes. Um, you know, on the RRG live stream, they occasionally uh, give away products and games and things, and uh, they were giving some of these away. And I think Anthony, uh, uh, yeah, put one of these aside for me. And posted out to me so thank you Anthony for that but also thanks to Solid Core for giving this to Anthony to start with uh, to do as a giveaway yeah and if you've not already gathered it's an automatic mouse joystick switcher so you plug your mouse into one port your joystick in the other and all you've got to do is just press the fire button and it automatically toggles the port over so if you want to use your mouse you just click your mouse button and your mouse is working if you then find you're in a two-player game or a game that needs the joystick port that the mouse is plugged into instead of having the rigmarole of having to unplug the things and plug things in you can just press the fire button on your joystick and it automatically switches on so we'll just give that a try i'll boot workbench up um, we'll then boot bubble bobble and uh, we'll just see if it automatically switches over so you just plug it into the port there we'll plug the mouse into the side and the joystick into the other it would be nice if this had some sort of cover because as I've mentioned a number of times CIA chips are super sensitive to ESD um, just you handling this and touching these connections here you could kill your CIA so you've got to be careful the best way to do it is to have it all powered off plug these in here then just plug the adapter and try and not touch the connections and then just stay away from it while you're using it and you'll be all right so i've zoomed you in there you can see the blue led we're currently using a mouse that's working if i press the fire button on the joystick see the led go out and if you saw my previous video there it might have been this one you can see you can use the joystick to move the mouse i was doing that in one of the other videos there you can see i can go downwards uh, going upwards is a bit of a challenge but yeah nevertheless you can see that i switched over to the joystick so we'll boot uh, Bubble Bobble, and I'll just uh, test that that is actually working. You know, we'll hit the fire button, and in theory, it should start player two of a two-player game. Most of my games are actually in storage in the loft. I've got a box with about, I don't know, 200 uh, original Amiga games. Um, there's, there's just some copies in there as well, I think, but it was part of a massive job lot I got years ago when I got my 1200. Anyway, as you can see, the mouse is enabled, and we'll just hit fire, and it should. Yeah, it did, it switched over. And if I press fire again, that should start a two-player game. The other way the game starts normally is obviously if you've got the joystick in the other port, then it starts a one-player game, but I should be player two now. Sweet. Yeah, that's working. Uh, and if you're not aware, I'm using, you can hear it, I'm using an arcade stick. I'll show you. Yeah, I covered this in a previous video. It had a bit of an unorthodox uh, slant here, but that was the style I went for. And uh, I made a little adapter, as you can see here. So I can plug my Neo Geo uh, arcade stick in there with the four buttons into there. But the nice thing is, the way I did the adapter here, I joined up a few things. So, for example, and I'll show you this, you can press the B button to jump on this game, the A button does bubbles, um, 
instead of having to press up to jump, you know, so you can, that does up as well in effect. And then the other thing I did is wire these up to left and right. So if I press that, that's the same as going left. That one's the same as going right. So on all those uh, decathlon slash track and field games where you have to waggle the stick and destroy your stick in the process, you can destroy the buttons instead, like that. So in theory, this should work with the ST and uh, anything else really, it'll probably work with the C64, I would think. Um, so yeah, at some point you might see this again on a C64 in one of my videos. Thank you very much SolidCore, it's fantastic. Um, I will show another SolidCore product a bit later on in this video. So this is the other SolidCore product that I was going to mention. Uh, really, really sweet ROM switcher. Now, my understanding is this bulb was originally designed by Kipper2K, a uh, guy who lives in the States. So yeah, periodically um, Kipper comes up with uh, new uh, products like this. He's done an 8 meg RAM expansion for these. He's done uh, numerous things actually. I think he was initially he was helping build the vampire boards. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I think he was. Um, at the moment, he's working on a replacement keyboard. Actually, the PCB for one of those. So if you know you don't no longer need a membrane, and you can replace the you can put little uh, chiclet type uh, switches on there. It might cost a little bit, but in theory, you should be able to you know build your own keyboard effectively. You know, you can get the new keycaps from a1200.net. And uh, you know you might need some something to some plastic or something 3D printing to hold various bits together. But anyway, that's something I might be able to look at in future one day. But right now we're looking at this. So uh, you can see he's got a single flash uh, EEPROM or something on there. I think it is. Um, I'm not sure what size that's going to be. It's going to be like uh, 16 meg or it might be 32 meg or 64 meg. It's going to be bigger than it needs to be probably. Um, you can see the little LED there for the power and there's two LEDs here that indicate which uh, slot you've got selected. So this has got uh, space there for four ROMs. So at the moment it's on the default ROM. There's also a jumper. Let's just sidestep and talk about that jumper. You saw in a previous video that um, on the earlier Rev3 and Rev5 motherboards, uh, Commodore dropped a clanger with the A17 uh, connection on the ROM socket. They wired it somewhere else where it shouldn't be. So if you fit, uh, which it's okay with a ROM, mask ROM, but if you stick an EEPROM in there like a 27C400, it doesn't work as you saw in that previous video. You have to swap that pin and then ultimately the pin that's where A17 is is the byte pin. You have to provide that with five volts. So you have to have an adapter. Long story short, he's got a jumper to handle that. So you can just Put, put that jumper on there and stick this into one of the older Rev boards like a Rev 5 or Rev 3. I bet hardly anybody's got a Rev 3. So yeah, that's the jumper for uh, older board pinouts. Uh, on the newer boards, like from a Rev 6 uh, upwards, I think, you don't need that jumper on, so it's just hanging on one side. No LEDs lit at the moment, which indicates it's on the first slot. So the first slot, as you can see, is Workbench 1.2. Now it's important to know, when you, if you want to buy one of these from Solid Core, you have to evidence that you've got these ROMs yourself, that you own the copyright to them. You know, I well, not own the copyright to them, but you've got a license to them. You know, you show a photo of your 500 motherboard, your 600 motherboard, your 1200 motherboard, and any of the ROM chips you bought uh, that are hanging around. You know, I think if you get that, what's it called, Commodore Forever or something, or Amiga Forever, forget what it's called. There's a CD you can debt buy. You can pay about I don't know 20 or 30 quid for it, and you get license to pretty much all the ROMs. So you could do that. The cool thing with this is, if I hold down Control Amiga Amiga, you get a reboot, and I'll just let that go through as normal. So I, I just tapped, you know, just for a second there, hold down Control Amiga Amiga. So that part works as normal, as you will see, it's still 1.2. And if I hold the keys down, I'll show you the, the LED on it, hang on. Yeah, so watch the LEDs, I'm going to write Control Amiga Amiga, I'm holding it down, just watch the LEDs. Bing! Did you see? First one lit. And pointing at the screen, you should see that should go to 1.3. I think, yeah, sweet. So yeah, uh, you can also, if you, whatever ROM you provide him, you know, provide him to stick on these, you can actually ask him for any customized versions of those. So I went with a 1.3, uh, and it was uh, Solid Core suggested this to me, 1.3 with uh, SCSI support, I think. So yeah, there was some hot fixes and things applied to 1.3 to enable uh, hard disk boot and I think uh, I think it'll boot from a hard disk anyway but I think yeah there's some SCSI support there in the version of 1.3 I've got and again if I hold control Amiga Amiga and you've got to hold it for about three or four seconds and then I'll tell you when what's going on here now That's 2.05. That would have shipped with a 600. Funnily enough, I do have that ROM from a 600. It's the only thing I have from a 600. 
Um, it came as part of a, a job lot. I've also got some 3.0 ROMs. I'm not sure I'm ever going to use those, but nevertheless, I thought it would be uh, cool because one of the things Solid Core pointed out is 2.05 versus the 2.04 that would have shipped with the 500 plus. Again, has some uh, change. I think it's got a fix there. Well, not really a fix. It might have a support for is it the PCM, PMC, PCM CIA and IDE? I think. I think that came in on 2.05. So yeah, that's useful. And again, Control Amiga Amiga. So again, we get the the, the reboot. But I'm holding it down there. Go. It's changed over. The LED, both LEDs are lit now to indicate it's on the fourth fourth ROM, and that should be 3.1. It's actually a, a customized version of 3.1. I think. With, various bug fixes and things in there yeah you can just about see up here 3.1 so I think that's almost the, the latest pretty much the latest version of 3.1 but you can use this on the 500 the 500 plus a 2000 uh, I'm guessing a 3000 uh, the 4000 has got two ROMs the same as the 1200 but you can get the 1200 version you know that it's, it's got two presumably it's got two things there you plug in and this might, might be joined by a ribbon or something I've got no idea how that works it might even be two separate chips no idea, but you can get this uh, those two different flavors there. I'll stick some links down below in the description. You can order these on Amibay. I'll post a link to the thread where you can order them. And I guess just talking about why, why would you want to do that? Well, if your Amiga is, let's just reboot. If your Amiga's got 1.2, then yeah, you're gonna be able to run lots of old games on it, but some of the newer games won't work on 1.2. And again, if you've got 1.3, you might find a few of the 1.2 games won't work on 1.3. Um, you know, and it goes on. If you've got an ECS, you know, machine. If this was a 500 plus, you might want to run some games that were designed for the 500. But you might want to have backwards compatibility with 1.2 and 1.3. Uh, and likewise, if I added a hard disk into here, which wouldn't be too much uh, effort actually, you can do that little ID adapter, you know, that um, gives you uh, an ID drive. It's all about you know support for that. And for testing purposes in general, you might just want to be able to easily swap between. ROM versions, you know, this is super useful for me for testing. That might be how I end up using this. I might buy another one, actually, because I've got a 2000 coming on the way. I might buy one of those from Solid Core um, and keep this one purely for testing purposes. I did. I think Solid Core did say he could, you know, as one of those four ROMs, you can pick whatever four ROMs you want. You can have anything on there. You can have four different variant, variants of 1.3 if that's what you wanted. But you could have Diag ROM as one of your ROMs there. Again, that's super useful. just helps you diagnose and test things out if something goes wrong with your system. And before I forget, there's something important to point out here. How is this working? There's some voodoo going on. It's very clever because the ROM pin out here, there's no reset line. This ROM does not have a reset. You're going to have address lines, data bus, power, ground, output enable, chip select. That's pretty much going to be it. There's going to be nothing else on there. So you've got to, you know, one of the first things I thought is, oh, I wonder how he's doing that then. How is he detecting the reset? It's going to be the reset vector. That's that's you know you've got the address lines coming on here, so it it must be monitoring the address lines and going ah oh, okay yeah you've got the reset vector set you know are you holding down control Amiga Amiga okay let's start a timer and it's counting and it's polling and checking it every you know however many nanoseconds for a period of three or four seconds and then it's incrementing the uh, thing there. That's really nice because it means you can momentarily. Press Control Amiga Amiga, even just for a second to reboot your machine, and you're not getting it incremental. You know, if I do that again now and hold Control Amiga Amiga, you'll see after about four seconds it changes. Uh, do it again, you'll see it'll just cycle up. So you can just keep going round and round and round until you get to the ROM you want. I mean, granted, the LEDs are only going to be visible when you're inside the machine here, but you're going to know what order the ROMs are in, so you could just keep uh, you know incrementing it there until you get to the ROM you want. So I had to change the jumpers there uh, to get the one mega of chip. You'll see that I moved it up into the top position there. So the default would have been on the bottom, you know, between pin two and three, and it's now between pin one and two, I think. Well, depending on which way around you look at it. I think pin one's at the bottom, actually, so it's between two and three. So I'll have to go around doing a chip mem test there on the full one meg, and as you can see, it's up to around 400. It's been going a few hours, that. No problems at all. So it's, uh, yeah, it's rock solid, the memory on this Rev6 board. So apologies, it's not been a particularly exciting video. It was interesting, I guess, to look at some of the solid core things, but yeah, it was just mostly cleaning up and recapping this one. Uh, and the Rev 5 boards you saw me do towards the back end of this video here. You can see uh, on both of these are marked up that was uh, repaired, uh, recapped, and I marked, you know, with a red dot, as you usually do, show which caps have been replaced. So it's the majority of them is just like one, two, three, four, five, six caps on here that still need to be done at some point. I will do them, I've just not had the chance, really. 
the fat Agnes that's on here, this is an A372A, this will support one meg of chip, but I was expecting that I'd still be able to support half a meg of slow, and that doesn't seem to be the case once you've fitted the RAM here. So you can still get slow RAM uh, by uh, the slot here, but as long as you've not done the jumper changes and fitted the RAM here, but this was filmed today, uh, actually, as I'm editing the video because I didn't have a, a close uh, segment, if you like, for the uh, the video. Um, so I've got some more 2000 videos coming. I've got another Rev3 video coming. I've got a recap of a 1200, recap of a CD32. I've got loads of Archimedes videos. I've got uh, Amiga 2000 videos, uh, num numerous of, like to do with upgrades and mods and things like that. Uh, a few different expansion cards for the 2000 that I need to cover. Uh, Sega CD and there's probably about 30 or 40 other videos that I just need to get around to finding the time to uh, edit um, so you can see I dropped a clang here and I completely uh, missed this so, you know earlier on in the video so I was going to swap this resistor um, and you can see the resistor I ended up with here I think this was a half a watt one it's smaller now than the one that was there so that makes me think it was one watt, and the one watt ones I've got are bigger than the one watt one that's there. It's, I don't know. I can't seem to win. Nevertheless, it's not that important. The size of these here are not that important. They're just feeding, I think it's the 12 volts. I could be wrong. I think it feeds the 12 volt to the, the ports here. I think one goes to this port and one goes to either that port or this port. Uh, I forget which one. I think that was the floppy drive one, isn't it? Nearest the floppy connector there. Um, anyway, these are kind of acting a bit like a few it's just kind of current limiting a little bit so this is why they burn out someone's plugged something in here that's uh, is this a serial port I think it may well be where it's not wired the, the same way the Amiga is subtly different I think and they've shorted out the 12 volt pin I think and that's why these typically burn out here you know see a big burn in the middle generally they'll still work generally if you measure over them they're still 47 ohms it's just got super super hot and you know made a burn mark on it um, so you don't always necessarily need to rush out and swap them if you don't all you're going to be doing is lacking the, the 12 volts to the uh, port here I mean if you're really unlucky and someone's put a really weird wired connector in they may have fed the 12 volt into one of the pins and killed one of these uh, receiver transmitter uh, ICs here and in fact I've got a video coming up hopefully I think uh, looking at one of these for one of my Patreons uh, with a, a serial issue Anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. If you can support via Patreon, please see the link down below. I'm sorry to keep mentioning, but you know what? It's the only thing that's keeping the channel going. And there were some people that have donated quite large amounts over the last four or five months, and that's, that, that support has to be uh, withdrawn, if you like. You know, people have supported me for three or four months, and you know, it's helped me get over a really difficult uh, part of my life. Um, and those donations have come down quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, the more people I can get on board just with a dollar or two or three dollars a month the the longer lasting the channel is going to be really i'm hoping to you know just keep going forever with this but um patreon ultimately is the only thing that is keeping it going anyway thank you very much for your support and i'll catch you in the next one